Tonight I'm going to be talking about how detoxing is important, how to do a detox, um, what to be looking for. There's no right or wrong detox, but there's right or wrong detox for each person. And we'll see, depending upon how the body is, it makes a difference, what's going on. So, sometimes it's easy, it's simple questions, sometimes we really need to delve into you to find out what's right and out of balance in you, and that can take a little bit of time. So what I did do was I did include a 20% off coupon for a consult, a 30 or 60 minute consult, that's good to be in the vehicle, you have to make a decision now. So that's there. We have our sales circular, we have a sheet on both sides, we have three or four more lectures coming up in the next month and a half. So that's there, and you can sign up upstairs if you would like. Um, we're also, has anyone done an iodizing detox foot bath where you put your feet in, and you think I'm crazy because I have this gadget I plug in the wall, your feet are in the water, and like my son said to me, I thought you loved me, why didn't you just give me a hair dryer and tell me to go take a bath? But it really is a great thing and it works. And so we have a special going on if you buy three sessions or the fourth session is free, and they have the information upstairs on that. And on the back counter are a bunch of books and magazines. You're welcome to the magazines. Every month we have them at no charge. There's good recipes and great health information in there for you. And Diane got a whole bunch of books that we usually sell, but everyone is welcome to take one. They're back there on curcumin. Anyone using curcumin? It is phenomenal. Um, the National Institute of Health, you know, the federal government, did a study on curcumin and being a little bit, um, I don't know what word I want to use, I figured they did the study to prove that it doesn't work. And they were so enlightened by what the results were, there's now three studies going on. And there are even there's some studies, mainstream studies going on for the prevention and treatment of certain cancers. It's a wonderful anti-inflammatory. Near the back of the book, they tell you about how to purchase it. The one, the BCM95, is one company that makes that, and a bunch of companies buy it and use their own label. That gives you a very good blood level in one to two capsules a day. To get that same blood level of the active ingredients, you would have to take probably 20 to 25 curcumin capsules. So it really winds up in the long run being less expensive and a lot easier because who wants to take 20, 25 capsules a day? You lose weight because you won't be able to fit any food in your stomach. <laughs> All right. Now, um, I'll start with, I saw this online, I think on Facebook, somebody posted it, and I thought that was great, and the beach is the only place where salt lowers your blood pressure. So, everything doesn't have to be good or bad. Salt can be terrible for us, and salt can be very, very helpful for us. And so we just have to have an open mind and look at things a little differently. Now, a lot of people, you know, what I hear a lot of times is, I've done everything and I'm tired of being sick. I want to be healthy. And the good part about that is you took the first step. The hard part of that is take some work and change because we all got to where we are because of our lifestyles and the food and stress and kids and parents and everything else. So we have to change things a little bit. And change is sometimes very, very hard. And today, most of us, even if we're healthy, we're filled with a lot of toxins. The environment is toxic. The food is toxic. We're not getting the antioxidants or the nutrients we should be getting from the food a lot of times. And most of us here are, I think, 20-something or older. So we're the fast food hydrogenated fat generation. You know, that was when Burger King, McDonald's came out. Everything was cooked in Crisco. Then we got TV dinners, you know, which was great. And then the microwave, phenomenal invention. You make all this delicious food, you reheat it in the microwave and destroy all the nutrients, but it's hot and fast. 
And that's what counts, is quick and easy. So we've really done a job on ourselves, not on purpose, but a lot of times we don't really think about it. And there's a few seats up front. Feel oh, free, come on in. Okay. So this slide, I'm talking about that disease is really a chain reaction. It's not one thing that makes us sick. It's usually a whole bunch of things over time. So you have these slides. You have two kids, a mortgage, a spouse, whether it be a man or a woman, or one of the same, um, emotional stress, poor sleep, um, not exercising enough, not eating well. Those all work against us. And it, it, each of these things brings us one step closer to going over the edge of the cliff. There isn't just one thing. We all deal with stress. But what if you get to be stressed, you're not eating well, you're not getting a good night's sleep, and you work where trucks are going by with diesel exhaust all the time. Or you get to be in one of those beautiful new buildings with all glass windows that don't open, so it's recirculated air, four years old recirculated air. What if you're in the airline industry and you have all that jet fuel and you're in a plane with recirculated air? What if you just work in a, in, wrong word, a normal place, a different place where it's relatively healthy, but they have a cleaning crew come in and they wound up using chemicals to wash the floor or to clean the bathrooms. So we're all exposed to toxins and all these things add up and eventually it affects our body and the liver gets overloaded, and the bile isn't made as well as it should be, and we get constipated, or we have leaky gut syndrome, and all that adds to the toxic load on our body. Now, mainstream-wise, thank God we have a lot of good pharmaceuticals, they're lifesavers, if we use them properly, but a lot of times we don't use them properly. And so, we're very good at putting Band-Aids on things, now, as we're going along, you'll see why toxicity and the digestive system being off leads to a lot of problems with the skin, with acne, with eczema, psoriasis, with colitis, ileitis, constipation, diarrhea, smelly gas. We have drugs for all those things to suppress the symptom. They either stimulate or suppress, and they work for a short period. The problem is the underlying imbalance gets worse. And if that's getting worse, eventually, it's not that you get used to the drug. It's that your imbalance got worse and the drug isn't strong enough to hold it back. So we're going to be, whoops, we're going to be talking about what you can do, what the different symptoms mean, and what you can do about them. do it old school way and hit the button. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Okay, liver. We're in society now, as we mature, we have a way of saying getting older, a lot of us, when we go to the doctor, they'll say, gee, your liver enzymes are going up a little bit, or you have a fatty liver. Don't worry about it. That's normal for somebody your age. Nobody should have a fatty liver. Nobody's enzymes should be going up. When they say that's normal for someone your own age, your age that means it's common. We're interchanging common with normal. So you don't want to be normal someone in our age. You want to be better than normal because in general we're not a healthy society. The liver does a lot of things. It makes bile which we need for digestion. It clears the blood of drugs and chemicals. It regulates blood clotting. Um, it helps with the protein and cholesterol making that and we need that to be um, <coughs> properly for us. It excretes waste product at night when we go to sleep. We do phase one, phase two detoxing, and that's dumped into the, that waste product is dumped into the bile. And nature hates wasting things, so we use the bile to dissolve fats. And I'll be showing you a couple of pictures down near the end um, about a very, very sick gallbladder loaded with stones. And 
we cut out the gallbladder. If it bothers you, let's remove it. Then it won't bother you. But most people who have their gallbladder removed have the same symptoms months down the road. They come back. And if you think about it, the gallbladder is a stupid <coughs> organ. It's not very intelligent. All it does is concentrate bile. So if it concentrates it and stones start forming, that is precipitating out. That means it was bad bile. It's the liver that needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But we just wait till the gallbladder gets sick enough that we remove it. Mm -hmm. And the liver was never addressed. So it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. One of the things that we don't think about, and I think I have a slide coming up on that, whenever we eat and we break down the food in the in stomach and the intestines, <coughs> as it crosses that barrier, gets into the bloodstream to nourish our whole body, the first stop is the liver. Everything we eat that crosses over goes right to the liver because things leak in there. And you could have bacteria or parasites or toxic chemicals, and it goes to the liver and the liver deactivates them to get rid of them, and then the blood with all the nutrients goes through the whole body. So what happens if your digestive system isn't working well? your liver is overloaded. Now when the liver is overloaded, you run into all different types of problems, which is on this slide. So our liver helps us with digestion, the lymphatic system, the immune system, mental health, the adrenals, dealing with inflammation. It helps us with hormone regulation. When women, in a cycle, estrogen goes up and down, and progesterone goes up and down. The way those levels get regulated is the liver metabolizes the excess. So what happens if the liver is overloaded? It can only do this much in a day, and if we're overloading it, a lot of things don't get dealt with properly, and the body can deal with it for a while, but eventually it gets overwhelmed, and that's when disease comes in. Um, back here. The analogy I like to use is think of a river. It starts at the snow cap, goes to the tributaries, to the body of the river, and then in this area, the Boston Harbor. That's how everything flows. Our body is the same thing. You can keep thinking of the river. I'm going to come back to that a few times. Our cells drain into our, dump their waste product into the lymphatic system, which comes down here and in through the ribs to the liver, and it comes up from the feet all the way up. We have a huge, the peonies patches, a bunch of um, lymph nodes right here. We have them in our legs. When you get sick, you might feel them in your throat, or the side of the chest, or the neck. They go into the liver, and from the liver, it does its job, and it either goes over to the kidneys or into the bile, and then we urinate out, or we have a bowel movement and get rid of the metabolic waste. So you have a river. And my thought for tonight was, each of us has our own river. And each of us has different dams in the river. So if you think of a river, and you have three dams in it, and the water's backing up all the way to the top, and you want to get the water flowing, which dam do you open up first? The one at the very top or the one down at the bottom? Do you start at the top of the mountain or the bottom of the mountain? The bottom. The bottom. The bottom. Because if you do the top one, things will flow down until it hits the next dam and you super flood that area. So what we need to do is look at our system, our river, and figure out where do we think our blockages are. If someone's constipated, it's not healthy for them to do a detox because you're going to loosen up all that junk and it's not going to have anywhere to go. So you're basically re-exposing you yourself to the toxins. We can get a few more chairs. We're going to line them up on the side if you want. There's another one there. Well, we have a full house tonight. Thank you all. So all of you, as we're going through this, think of your river. Think of where your problems are. Are you constipated or do you have irritable bowel? Do you have some ways to tell if your liver's overloaded. If you used to be able to have a glass of wine or a drink, and now all of a sudden you can't tolerate alcohol. If no matter what you eat, you can never figure it out, you get bloated. If you have a right-sided headache, 
if you're a woman and you have a menstrual headache, every time you get your period around ovulation, that's a liver issue. It's not a female hormone issue. So there's all these different signs that can tell you where you need support. And so it's really, I think it's fun. You know, once you start figuring out, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, when you find that one piece, that all of a sudden the picture makes sense. Has anyone done the detox and felt sick from it, or felt lousy? Because that's a big problem. If you push the body too hard, too fast, you feel worse, because you need energy to heal and to do the detox. The rabbit and the hare, slow and steady, always gets you to the end point much faster and trying to zip through it. And so, a nice slow detox, much, much healthier for you. You don't have to take a week off and stay in bed. You can go along with a normal life and everything will work well. And I keep hitting the wrong button on this and that's probably what's keeping this up. Let's see if that'll work. There we go. All right, that's your digestive system. And really, it's pretty simple. We chew the food goes into the stomach, and the stomach it mixes with amylase and hydrochloric acid. When it's mixed properly, the valve at the bottom of the stomach opens up and it goes into the small intestines, and that winds up being, whoops, thought I had another slide there, a disassembly plant, where it's timed. You have a normal peristaltic movement that goes right along, different enzymes are dumped in at different times, you break down that complex food, it gets absorbed, we poop out the waste product, we nourish the body, and everybody's happy. What happens to us? How many of us sit and chew our each mouthful 5, 10, 15 times? Very few people. If you're eating a piece of meat or something hard, we usually chew it enough so we can swallow that big piece and not choke on it. And that's chewed well. But it isn't. They gave us, nature gave us a mouthful of teeth. We're supposed to be like a cow, you know, not chewing our cud, but we're supposed to macerate it. We're supposed to grind it up. That allows it to digest better. So we get more nutrients out of it. It doesn't sit in the stomach longer. One of the problems we have, which we'll get into in a couple of slides from now, we have more people using proton pump inhibitors, or Zantac, or Maalox, or antacids, and they're great, and they have a place, but nature didn't give us our stomach producing quarts of acid a day just for the heck of it. It's not like a kit from Ikea where they gave us extra things that we don't really need. We need that acid. It balances the pH. It kills bacteria. It activates our enzymes. So when you're on one of the acid blockers, that winds up not allowing your enzymes to work as well. So most people start getting either diarrhea, constipation, and gas, and a real odor. And the reason being, this is a closed system. So think what your food would be like if in the middle of the summer, you took a delicious dinner, ground it up in the food processor, put it in a Ziploc bag, and left it on the counter in the sun at 98 degrees. It would get gassy and rot. And when you have smelly gas or smelly stools, that's the food fermenting and not digesting properly. And when you think about it, there's a lot of problems with that. One, it's toxic to the body. Two, you spend all this time and money preparing this great meal and you're not absorbing most of the nutrients. And three, the body has to spend all this energy trying to get rid of this rotting food. So, Life and death really do begin, and healing begins in the digestive system. Digestion and elimination, and what we eat, is really the corner, cornerstone of either health or disease. So, think about relaxing when you eat. Just as an aside, we didn't uh, talk on the adrenals. Our adrenals, two glands on top of our kidneys, two major functions, fight or flight, feeding and reproduction. You can't be in both camps at the same time. So if you are stressed, you are in fight or flight. The blood goes to the big muscles in the brain. You walk out of a cave, there's a lion there who wants to eat you. We're designed for severe stress, short bursts. He eats you, you kill him, or you escape. It's over in a couple minutes. 
nowadays, how many people have a two minute stress and then the rest of the day is beautiful? <laughs> so our blood is diverted away from the digestive tract. And so we're eating and the processing is much, much slower. And that's not good for us because we're not getting the nutrients. So you need to take 20 minutes, a few deep breaths, and sit down and relax and eat. And we need to figure out ways to be stressed. Okay, this is where we're really going in society. We either have people who are taking care of themselves or people who are eating the standard American diet. And if you think about it, being like this gentleman is really for <laughs> the majority of people, it's self-inflicted. We do that to ourselves. There are some people that might have a genetic problem, but that's a minority. Very, very few people. They're saying now that in the younger generation, the kids, even preteen, that are obese, that are overweight, that over 80% of them will be diabetic in their 20s. And that's preventable almost entirely. And it has to do with lifestyle, stress, and mainly our diet. So, if you eat healthy food, unprocessed, there's no ingredient list on it. If you buy um, something that's a nice clean product, it tells you it, what it is. And it doesn't have 40 chemicals listed. And so, you can really tell by ingredient list and names, if you can pronounce them and understand them, is probably a healthier product. On this side of it, you have all the processed foods. Now, what's wrong with processed foods? What's wrong with them is they have a lot of hydrogenated fats, a lot of things that our body wasn't designed to digest and to deal with. Mother Nature didn't know about hydrogenated fats or all the chemicals and dyes. So our system wasn't meant to deactivate them and get rid of it. So it stresses the liver and the whole system. Also, white flour, white sugar, the outer part of the plant was stripped off. That had all the vitamins in it. Nature, for the most part, in all of our foods, puts in it what mammals need to digest it. So some dummy way, way back decided getting cane sugar and grinding it up and having all those brown flecks in it, like in really raw sugar, that's not good. It has to be white. And um, flour can't have little specks in it. We have to strip off the outer part and bleach it so it's snow white and then it's good. What that did was it took the nutrients out that the body needs to digest it. So when you eat white flour, white sugar, overly processed foods, the body has to digest it or it's going to rot. So what it does is it draws those nutrients out of our system to the digestive system to help you digest and eliminate that bad food. So that leaves you with a nutritional deficiency. So in addition to the nutrients not being in the food, it's robbing your body. And that eventually leads to this gentleman because your metabolic rate goes down, you start having high blood sugar, body pumps out more insulin, it goes down, that makes you crave sugar, and you're doing this. And when your blood sugar is doing this, you make fat, not energy. So the fat really starts running your metabolic rate. And so very, very interesting. People, I tell people that say, I don't have a problem with any of this stuff. And I say, how about for 48 hours, and if any of you have heard this, I'm sorry, food eating. But 48 hours, no sugar, white sugar, you can have fruit, and no white flour, and try to cut back on gluten. Just 48 hours. And if you start in the morning, on the second day, that night, have a pizza, a big bowl of pasta, or a beer, some garlic bread, knock your socks off and then call me and let me know how you feel. Mm -hmm. Most of us, our energy is down here, and that's normal, because that's as good as it gets all the time. And when you just eliminate sugar, gluten, and white flour, your energy goes back to normal. Then when you eat it again, you notice the difference, because all of a sudden you're up here, you go right down, people say, I can't believe how bloated I was, how exhausted I was, compared to the day before. Just in 48 hours. Try it. It's not going to hurt you. But sometimes 
like when you get a cold, you realize how good feeling good feels. And you know, we take it for granted. Okay, so when you eat junk food and refined food, you have a loss of nutrients, and then we have all the additives in it. There was, if any of you, we have a program called the Fresh Start Program. When you go, go online and look up glycemic load, and that's about how, it, how a food affects your blood sugar. And would you believe if you ate a real good, well-made vanilla ice cream with a full fat in it, that affects your blood sugar less than the low fat, low sugar ice cream. And it'll satisfy you more because it's delicious and it tastes good. And so all, one of the reasons we're getting so fat and having such high cholesterol and fat problems and fatty liver is where if we eat the low sugar foods, they pump up the hydrogenated and the bad fats. If we eat the low fat foods, they have to add a lot of chemicals in it and things to make it taste good. If, so go to the, go to the um, supermarket and get a reduced fat or a reduced sugar ice cream and the real ice cream and look at the ingredient list. The real ice cream, the ingredient list is about that long and the supposedly healthier one is this long and it's a ton of chemicals. And that goes with all the food. And so we really have to watch what we're eating. Artificial colors. Is there any reason why, even in vitamins, your vitamin has to be green, <coughs> or red, or medicine has to, or toothpaste has to have bright colors in it? Who cares, as long as it does a good job. But all those dyes, we have to deal with. And that's really doing a job on us. Soda, first time in I don't know how long, Coke and Pepsi are saying their sales are down. Ooh, I don't know how that happened because it's been bad news forever, but sales are going down. They're full of, let's, I'm not even going to talk about the diet ones. The diet ones are so full of chemicals, I think if you had to drink something, I'd rather you drink the one with all the sugar in it, and that's killing you, but the other one is killing you faster. It's loaded with sugar, it, believe it or not, it increases your cravings for sugar. It also decreases energy. When you have sugar, not just a little bit, but you have a teaspoon of sugar, within 30 minutes, your white blood cell activity is slowed down. And that can last up to 10 or 12 hours. So what is that doing to our immune system if you're sipping soda all day long? Your immune system is destroying it. Now it'll bounce back when you stop. A couple of statistics. A 20 ounce bottle of Coke has 65 grams of sugar, or 16 and a half sugar cubes in one bottle of soda. And nobody has a little can of soda. It's always two liters, because two liters cost less than a can. So why would you buy a can? And if you have it bigger, you're gonna drink more of it. Um, teenagers, in 2008, boys 12 to 19 in the country, and a lot of kids don't drink soda, but when they took the amount of soda that that age group drank, it was 868 cans of soda per boy wow. and girl between 12 and 19 years old per year. 800. Um, girls are a little better, they only drink 651 on average. <laughs> so soda should be off. Well, I guess I shouldn't legislate and take things off the market. We should be smart enough to choose what we're eating and be healthy. Okay, so any toxin that goes into the body, first thing that goes into the liver to help make whatever was coming in healthy. <coughs> our liver is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just like our heart. Now, we run into some problems with the liver because if it gets overloaded, it tells... It has valves, but basically it tells the body in that river, hold on to some of that stuff. I need some time to play catch up. And what happens is since everything's coming up the portal vein into the liver, a lot of times when the liver starts getting overloaded, we get bloated, we get gassy, 
we get a foggy brain because the body's getting a little toxic. And what do we do? We take ibuprofen, we take ranitidine, the Zantac, and the first thing that the liver, that the body has to do when you take a chemical is bring it to the liver to detoxify it. So you overload the liver even further. Now, if you think, if you, again, Google and go online and look at the blood supply in the body, when someone const isn't constipated, so they're not straining and they didn't just deliver a baby, and they're having varicose vein problems, or they keep getting hemorrhoids, that, my mentor always said, is a liver issue. It's that the liver is slowing down, taking the blood, so the pressure is building up, and the hemorrhoids, the hemorrhoidal veins pop, or the um, varicose veins get worse. So there's far-reaching problems that really go back to digestion, to helping the liver, to eating well. And so also if you're eating better, you're not as constipated, so you're not pushing as hard, which helps the hemorrhoids. But that and gallbladder issues, for the most part, are really a liver problem. And this is sort of a schematic. So the, that big blue vessel is everything from down here coming up to the liver. And if the liver, everything's circulating all the time, if the liver puts its finger over that hose, the pressure builds up. That's the picture I was looking before. That's your digestive tract, this assembly plan, which I thought was really pretty cute. It goes from your teeth all the way down, it breaks things down, and into the toilet. Very important. Timing is everything because if the what happens is as that bolus of food is going through, once it leaves the stomach, it's automatic. The body knows in X number of minutes, drop these um, enzymes in because that bolus of food will be there. What if you're constipated and the stool is blocking the way? The enzymes come in, but the food's here. It starts rotting. What if you're on an antacid? or one of the drugs. It's not that bolus isn't acidic enough, so your enzymes don't work efficiently. So the food's rotting. When it's rotting, you get leaky gut. When you have leaky gut, things get absorbed that shouldn't, and the liver gets overloaded. And so it's a sort of a vicious cycle, but you can spin it the other way very, very easy, and it goes into lifestyle and, and diet. And that's really all you need to do. So without stomach acid, and I won't ask who is using an acid blocker, but they say over 60% of the population at one time or another is using acid blockers. Your enzymes don't work, your immune system's burdened, protein isn't fully digested, which then is toxic to the body. Um, you're more acidic. One of our problems, there's a book, anyone heard of Red pH Miracle? Wonderful book. The only thing is, your body is one of the best pH machines in the world. It can balance your pH better than any drug or any supplement you can take. The problem is you have to give it the right foods. And most of us that are too acidic, it's that we're not digesting well or we're eating the acidifying foods and not eating enough of the alkalinizing foods. We're eating a real heavy diet on animal protein and very few vegetables and very few grains, you're going to be very acidic. So the answer isn't take something to make yourself less acidic, it's give the body the foods it needs to do its job properly, and things will get much, much better. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about free radicals, and they're not really that complicated. It goes into a little bit of chemistry, but we're going to keep it as simple as possible because we don't need to get into real depth. Whenever there's anything metabolically going on in the body, we generate on a good healthy day with a good healthy diet a huge amount of free radicals. But the good food we're supposed to have has an awful lot of antioxidants and I'll tell you what they do, but an antioxidant neutralizes free radicals. Now we have all the chemicals we're putting on our skin, we're breathing, the poor food we eat sometimes, that causes a burst of free radicals. When we're stressed, we have a huge amount of free radicals because the metabolic rate goes way up, and we can deal with that. 
Now, there are some people that are in their 70s, 80s, that look like they're in their 40s or 50s, and there's some people in their 50s that look like they're 90. <laughs> Stress has a lot to do with that. And when you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, you're not digesting well, you're not metabolizing well, you are overloaded with free radicals, and that ages us. Think of the sun. When we get exposed to the ultraviolet light, the reason it damages our skin is it generates free radicals on the skin. That's going on inside, in our blood vessels, in our organs, in all the tissues. And so we really need to take care of it. So this is a cell in the intestines. On the lower left are antioxidants, our DNA is in the nucleus, and then we have some free radicals. So as long as we have enough antioxidants, they're gonna grab the free radicals before they can do any damage. What if you don't, if you have too many free radicals or you're not eating good food, you don't have enough antioxidants, those free radicals, they will damage any protein structure. So they're gonna damage the DNA, they're gonna damage the lining or the cell wall, they're gonna damage the lining of the intestinal tract, our skin, our blood vessels, our brain, because they go, they're in the blood. So they go everywhere, because we need blood everywhere. They target the proteins? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so top one, you have a normal oxygen molecule. Every, during metabolism, one of the electrons gets knocked off. So that bottom one, it's unbalanced. So that's a free radical. It's looking for an electron, because nature likes everything in balance. So what can happen, let's say on the cell membrane, if you have an anti, if you have a free radical that damages one of the cells, one of the molecules, it starts a chain reaction like ping pong balls, and it starts damaging every single piece of protein on that, or every molecule, and it generates more and more and more free radicals. Down here, these little white things with the brown, that's the lining of the cell membrane. So the free radicals start damaging them and you start having leaky membranes, cells die, the gut starts leaking. Antioxidants have a lot of electrons, so they donate electrons to the oxidants, to the free radicals, and that neutralizes them. Glutathione does this, the B vitamins, vitamin C, alpha lipoic acid, but we get that from real food. And if we're not eating enough real food, we're generating more free radicals and we have less antioxidants to protect ourselves. And like I said, stress is worse. That's why a lot of people, if they're financially secure and they finally retire and they're enjoying life, all of a sudden, instead of getting looking older and older, they start going the other way. And they look better and better. How does that happen? Defeating the machine. Okay, intestinal bacteria. Now we're gonna tie all these different areas together, don't worry. They're very, very important. There's good bacteria, there's bad bacteria. Um, we have billions of bacteria. We have more bacteria, healthy bacteria, in our digestive tract than we do cells in our whole body. How's that for a fact? There's more little bugs in your bowel than with cells in the whole body. Very, very important. We're drinking chlorinated water. We have chlorinated to kill bad bacteria. It's not a smart bomb, it's killing the good bacteria. We're eating chicken and beef and milk and dairy products that has in. They, first they were saying they're treating the livestock, but there's not enough in there, don't worry about it. Now they're finding detectable amounts in humans that are eating these products. They're killing good bacteria. We had up until recently, a lot of mainstream medicine saying taking probiotics, that's just a scam. There's no need for that. We irradiate all our food because the water we're watering it with isn't as clean as it should be, and we don't want to get any type of organism, so we're killing the soil-based organisms. You know, I remember my grandmother used to have well-rotted manure delivered, her neighbors loved her, and she would turn it into the soil. She had an organic garden, and my mother used to have a fit because we would always go over there and she would pull a carrot out of the ground that in the fall manure was put in. She'd wipe it off on her and she always had a, um, 
an eight, eight, thank you, an apron on. She'd wipe the dirt <laughs> off and give it to us. And my mother would come running out yelling, you have to scrape the outside off, we have to wash it. And she said, no, you're getting rid of all the healthy stuff. Mm -hmm. So she was a peasant from Russia. No college education. I think she had like a sixth grade education. She was brilliant. She knew, and it wasn't the internet, it wasn't book knowledge, she just knew. My father remembers cod liver oil, and he said she didn't give us a spoon, it was like a shovel, you know, it was a big, and he said growing up, you knew what kids got cod liver oil because you could smell them downwind, you know, it really used to smell like dead fish, but her answer was shut up and take it, it's good for you. She didn't know why, but you were healthier if you took cod liver oil. Now we're so smart, and we think that the food companies and the processes approved must be good for us. We have to go back to the basics and eat things, not microwave them, lightly saute them, eat a lot of raw foods. It doesn't have to be a total raw diet. Anything too extreme I don't think is good. It should be a little bit of everything. But um, we really need those good bacteria. There's some of the bad bacteria really have a purpose in our body. Candida, we all have candida. That should be in background amounts. That's like a few weeds in your lawn if you take care of your lawn. Candida is very, very good because what candida does, if you're releasing toxic metals, especially from mercury amalgams, candida blooms to bind it up so it goes out in the stool and you don't reabsorb the heavy metal. Also, candida, when cells, the good bacteria, die, candida eats the metabolic waste of the dead cells. So if everything's in balance, you don't have a candida infection. But then we're taking antibiotics, or you take an antibiotic, and there's a battle going on in the intestinal lining. That's very fertile soil. And the good guys, and the good grasses and the weeds are fighting who's going to hold on to that soil. So if we take antibiotics and we kill some of the bacteria, the weeds come marching in. And candida is very, very good or bad, depending upon how you look at it. Candida changes the environment in the gut when it's blooming. And it makes it what the good bacteria don't like and what they can thrive on. It also, its metabolic waste, crosses the blood-brain barrier and makes you crave sugar, <coughs> simple carbs which kills the good bacteria and strengthens candida. So there's a battle going on. What we need to do is sort of mind our own business, put all the good nutrients in and let them fight it out. We shouldn't be trying to swing it one way or the other if we're healthy. Because if, let's say, you were exposed to a little mercury, you want the amount of candida to go up a little bit to get rid of it. That's not a bad thing. Then when there isn't anything for it to eat, it's going to die off to background amounts. Now, a problem we're really having now is with C. difficile, C. diff, mm -hmm. and that's a hideous infection. C. diff hides in the lining of the intestines, and it waits till your immune system goes down, and it's very opportunistic. And once it starts growing, it's very hard to get rid of. They use drugs like um, vancomycin, which sterilizes the bowel. It kills everything. Mm -hmm and C. diff we want to stay away from. One of the problems we're having with C. diff is it's coming from the way we're raising dairy products, you know, in the, stay, in the barns, not free range, and it's getting into the food supply. What's very interesting, one of the things they use for C. diff is Saccharomyces boulardii. It's a, it's a yeast, but it's a beneficial yeast, and this Taking people with C. diff that are, that are being treated, taking a good probiotic and Saccharomyces twice a day, we're now even seeing the hospitals are discharging people with orders for it because it's undeniable how well it works. That's letting Mother Nature do what Mother Nature does best. We're helping her instead of atomic bombing her. So bacteria and pets, it was also very interesting. There was a study release. <coughs> I won't put my spin on why this pharmaceutical company is interested, but there's a, do a couple of oncologists, and one of them said up to a few years ago, I was saying probiotics and healthy bacteria were a waste of time and money, 
and he's now heading up research saying he thinks the answer for cancer is going to be from the good bacteria in a healthy gut. Now granted, they're going to probably want to make something and have it patented and all that, but I think it's so exciting that they're acknowledging we're not going to cure cancer. We can prevent it or we can help our body do the job. And so that, I think, that was a 180 degree twist. And so that was very interesting. Okay, hydrochloric acid, digestive enzymes, and bile help keep things in balance in the gut. So we're back to, and I'm sorry if I keep hammering it, detoxing. The gut has to be healthy and strong before you even start a detox. If your gut isn't working and you loosen up toxins in your body, you're gonna go in the blood, get into the bowel, get reabsorbed, and it's just like you walked into a, a very toxic environment and re-exposed yourself. You're better off leaving them buried where they are. So you need to think about the river and starting downstream <laughs> and slowly working your way up. Um, or not, has anyone heard of SIBO, small intestinal, intestinal bacterial overgrowth? That, believe it, you're going to be reading more and or seeing, hopefully not experiencing more and more about that. SIBO is when the good bacteria that are supposed to be there go crazy and you have way too many of them. So a good thing can become a very, very bad thing. And what's happening with that is people are having all sorts of symptoms that they can't put their finger on. Bloating, whatever they eat, they feel worse. If they eat a lot of it, they feel bad. If they eat a mouthful of it, they feel bad. If they go on an elimination diet, they feel bad. If they eat junk food, they feel bad. If they eat healthy food, they feel bad. And so, of course, they probably just need a psychiatrist. There's nothing wrong. But when you have a small intestine bacterial overgrowth of the good bacteria, the first thing people do is, I must need probiotics. So they put more in there, and they get worse. When the bacteria start growing out of control, they eat sugar and ferment it into alcohol. So people get very groggy after they eat. They'll eat fats and minerals, stealing the body of B12, tryptophan, and other amino acids. That's what we make a lot of the neurotransmitters from. So yes, you do need a psychiatrist, but it's because of you're not making enough neurotransmitters. They overwhelm the glutathione enzymes. That's one of our main um, detoxing enzymes. They deconjugate bile salts in the small intestines, which then goofs up amino acid absorption. Every drop of their waste product is absorbed from the small intestines through the portal vein where it overloads the liver. They get bloated and everything starts backing up. Day to day there's a flood of toxins pouring into the liver from the bacteria and what they're doing to our food. And the worst part is these people start losing a lot of weight because they're not getting any nutrients out of their food. And so it's really, again, it's almost preventable, but most people who get it were eating healthy diets. It's just they had crossed the line by the time they started eating healthy diets. So there's our beautiful liver, does phase one, phase two detoxing. Phase one takes fat soluble, very dangerous products and it breaks them down one step. Unfortunately, that first step, they're even more toxic than the original substance. Then it goes over to phase two, which the antioxidants deactivate and it's safe when we poop it out. Phase two is the rate limiting step. Phase one will go 900 miles an hour, but if you don't have the nutrients, phase two doesn't work well, so you're generating even more dangerous products, or byproducts, so it becomes even more unhealthy for you. So supporting your liver, very, very important. If the liver isn't doing its job right, you make lousy bile, you can start forming um, thank you, bile stones, <laughs> gall stones. Go ahead, I'm, I'm turning 61 soon, so I'm going to have one of those points. Um, so, when do we do phase one, phase two detoxing? At night when we're in REM sleep, and that's another big area. Digestion is the biggest problem, and lack of sleep is the second biggest problem in the country. If you're not getting a good, everyone has different amounts, they need five to seven hours of good REM sleep. 
That's not ambient sleep where you're knocked out, or um, Benadryl, or NyQuil where you're knocked out. Good REM sleep cycles, that's when the liver does phase one, phase two. If you're not doing that, <laughs> liver's a great organ. It's going to say, well, next Thursday she'll start getting some sleep. Let's store all that toxic stuff. Most of the toxins are fat soluble. What happens if next Thursday never comes? You never get a good night's sleep. Eventually, the liver has to bring fat in to store those toxins to keep them away from your heart, and your eyes, and your brain, and that's where fatty liver starts coming in. That's where fibromyalgia starts coming in. The body buries the toxins in the connective tissue. So anyone that has fibromyalgia, if you have a night or two of good sleep, you feel like a million dollars. But what do you do? You haven't been able to do much for a week. So you go out and overdo, you generate all this metabolic waste, you don't get a good night's sleep, and then you crash and burn, and you ache afterwards. So it's a toxicity issue, and it's the river. But there isn't a solution, one solution for fibromyalgia. But there are solutions for it, but everyone has different dams in their river. So it's more working with someone to figure out where the river isn't flowing, starting downstream and breaking it up and supporting it, and most people can really start moving forward. Okay, so I talked about bile toxicity. If the bile isn't a good quality bile, it irritates the bile duct. We're having a lot of people coming in with pancreatitis, unknown origin. But then, lo and behold, their digestion is way off. They have toxic bile problems. And the bile duct comes down, and the duct from the pancreas comes down, and they join. It's like, well, why? And if this duct is irritated, the irritation goes up into the, towards the pancreas. So we treat the pancreas. But we don't even think about their diet, their bowel, or their liver. But when you start supporting the whole area, it's funny, everything usually clears up. So it must just be a spontaneous heal, which is great. Um, phase two, again, we need to make sure we have good food and good sleep for that. Because if not, if we're not having good phase one and phase two, we really we get tired, we get bloated, and we start generating a huge amount of free radicals, and that's really killing us. It's aging us very, very fast. I talked about candida and the heavy metals. Um, the heavy metals, glutathione is used. That's one of the body's big protectors. And most of us don't have enough glutathione because we've used it all up. The body will make glutathione from building blocks, but it has to absorb the food, break it down and absorb it well. Also, just as an aside, if somebody is very toxic, <coughs> we don't want to take or use glutathione right away because even though it's very good you need a lot of antioxidants for the body to use glutathione appropriately so the first step should be get your antioxidant load in and get all the bins filled up and then put the glutathione in and you'll fly some people when they add glutathione they go backwards and that's the reason because you have let's say three out of four pieces you need but you don't have that last piece so the machine can't run so it isn't really complicated, but you just have to keep going backwards. My mentor, Dr. Hinge, used to always, we'd analyze a case, and we figure your problem out. And he'd say, that's great. Why didn't her body adapt to that? So then we'd work on it and go a little further back, and he goes, great. Why did that happen? Her body shouldn't, and a healthy body doesn't do that. And you keep going back till you find the underlying imbalances. When you treat this area, everything that came after it starts getting better. Whereas if you do the mainstream way that we were all taught, let's just figure out how can we get rid of or suppress this symptom. The symptom is caused by something back there. So that's where we can make you feel better for the time being, but we need to fix the why. So always try to figure out your why. Anyone that has acne or psoriasis, that's a gut issue unless it's from in, coming in contact with a chemical. When the body can't eliminate the right way through the urine and the stools, 
nature knew we were going to screw up her machine and gave us our skin as a safety valve. So all that junk comes out and it's very, very irritating. And most people with eczema or psoriasis at night when they're in bed, especially in the winter, they scratch till they bleed at night. That's because at night, you're, the air's cold, you're all bundled up and you start perspiring and the body is bringing out all that junk and it's very, very irritating. When people with um, rashes or eczema or hives, if you get really stressed, you start itching like crazy. And that's the adrenal response and the body is generating all these free radicals so more junk is coming out. And when you calm down, the stress gets better. You know, so you really have to think about it. So one, you have to get rid of the person that's stressing you. And two, you have to start nourishing and fixing the gut. Okay. So from bile toxicity to leaky gut, how do we get there? Well, if the, bile, if the liver isn't doing its job, the bile's toxic, it disrupts the bowel, you start generating free radicals, you're damaging the tissue, the bacteria are falling apart and dying, bacteria form a very tight lining on the bowel and they only allow what should get absorbed to get absorbed. What happens if you kill off a bunch of them? You have bigger <coughs> openings. So things get absorbed that should get absorbed. And we already talked about what happens to all these things. You overload your system and that causes real problems. So the first step in getting healthy or staying healthy or detoxing is to get the gut working properly. That's the healthy lining. In our digestive tract, the epithelial cells are one layer thick, not like our skin. It's just one layer of these cells, and they're like a baby's bottom, a newborn baby. Very, very delicate. They have a layer of mucus and six and a half pounds of healthy bacteria. Mm -hmm. That protects them from the acids and the enzymes and the food. Food's irritating by itself. So if you look at this slide, the nutrients go in through the cells if everything's working well. And all the metabolic waste and the toxic stuff just goes right down and out to Boston Harbor. When the lining starts getting inflamed or you have leaky gut, the cells get all wrinkled and there's bigger openings between them and the toxins go right into the bloodstream. And food particles, someone that has food sensitivities, not anaphylaxis, you have a peanut and you're in the hospital, but if you have food sensitivities, that's from leaky gut. You're absorbing, let's say chicken should be a three molecule group that will fit through. And you have leaky gut, you might have a nine molecule group that gets into the bloodstream. Your immune system's responding appropriately. That's a foreign substance, it's dangerous. So you start having an immune response to it, and you start having an allergic reaction or a sensitivity to it. So the answer is, eliminate those really reactive foods to calm the system down and tighten up the gut to up there, and you're not gonna absorb those nine molecule pieces. You'll be back to only getting the two molecule pieces through, which is what the body was designed to do. That makes sense? Okay. So, leaky gut releases toxins in the system. An overloaded liver pushes the toxins back into the bloodstream. The circulatory system sends it all through the body, which generates more free radicals. The intestinal lining becomes more damaged. The toxins then are getting back into the bloodstream, triggering autoimmune antibodies and cytokines to fight the antigens. And then the cytokines bring in the lymphocytes and toxic, and toxic oxidants, free radicals are produced which leads to more and more of that. So you can you see how from a lousy diet, you can kill yourself. It's no wonder we're not, a lot of us aren't feeling as well as we should. So then people say, okay, I'm gonna use a detox tea, and it's mainly senna, and senna's an irritant laxative. So you go to the bathroom six times a day for a week, and you say, I did a great detox. All you did was get ready for a colonoscopy. <laughs> but you didn't do anything else. You haven't fixed the lining. You haven't put good bacteria in. You haven't detoxed the body. You got the stool out. And that's great. That's step point one. But you don't need to do it with an irritant laxative. All righty. Uh, hit the button again. Okay, there's some causes of leaking gut.
Clearly we need to do too many buttons on this control. Okay, antibiotics, alcohol, caffeine, drugs, diet, high refined carbs, um, environmental contaminants, insufficient digestive enzymes. Okay, that's another whole area we can talk all night. Enzymes. Some people say, if you take an enzyme product, that is good short term, but if you take it all the time, your body's going to stop making enzymes. That's false. We have a certain amount of enzymes in our body to use in a lifetime. We're going to make a certain amount. Mother Nature, like I said earlier, put enzymes we need in the food to digest it. A lot of our enzymes were meant to get into the bloodstream to deal with injury and inflammation. That's the proteolytic enzymes. And we have products upstairs if you're injured or after surgery that help break up all that junk that's in there. What's happening is if we're not eat, if we're eating food that's lacking in the enzymes, the body's making the enzymes that are supposed to be protecting our tissues and all of our organs, but we'll bring those enzymes into the digestive tract because you have to nourish. If you're not getting nourished, you're going to die. So it figures out what's more important. So you digest better, but you have more inflammation and aches and pains. So by taking a digestive enzyme, you are allowing the body to use its enzymes appropriately for whether it needs it for digestion or for inflammation and injury. So you can't you can overdo enzymes. You don't want to take huge amounts because if there's no food to break down, they're going to start breaking down protein, and that's the stomach and the intestines. But you need to have enough enzymes. Very, very important. There's all different types of good enzymes. Um, some of them have bile in it. So if you've had your gallbladder out, you want to make sure you get an enzyme that also has bile. If your liver and your um, gallbladder, as far as you know, are fine, you don't need the bile. You can just go with an enzyme product. But very, very important you know, to really think about it, what causes leaky gut, the enzymes, the good bacteria, they help us with digestion, elimination, and 60-70% of our immune system comes from those good bacteria. Okay, so to increase your health, you want to have good nutrition, as few drugs as possible. I'd love to say no stress, but that would make me need a psychiatrist. Um, we want to limit stress. Now stress, I had a client, she was 86, and she all took years, and she was feeling much better, and she said, I finally discovered the secret of life. <coughs> and that, what movie was that? The Cow Billy Crystal and the Cowboys, and he said, the secret of life is this, and he held his finger up. But she said, the secret of life is, is the 20-80 rule, that we use 20% of our dishes 80% of the time, 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. We can get rid of 80% of the stuff in our house and not even miss it. She said, that's important, but forget about it. She said, stress. 80% of the things that stress you, you have no chance of changing. 20% you can change, because you're in control of. But she said, we spend almost 100% of our time trying to fix the 80% that we're never going to change. So, she, so I said, well, that's great, so I'll change 20%. So I still have 80% of things that are really stressing me. So thanks for your tip, but, you know, thanks. She said, no, she said, someone at work or at home or a situation, for years, you always bang heads. You come up to it, you know this is the right way to do it. They want you to do it this way. And you get stressed, and it's sort of like, let me slam my finger in a drawer again and see maybe it won't hurt this time. She said, spend some energy figuring out how to go around them. So let them think that you're doing it their way, and they're right, and you're wrong, and do it their way, and then go home and go around them and get to the end point and have your stress be lower. Why keep stressing over the same things you're never going to change? And I'm thinking, how oh, simple. It's hard to do. But how simple and basic is that? And I'm thinking, okay, 60 years, I never even thought of that. And in a few areas, it took an awful lot of work to figure out a way to tiptoe around, but it really does work. 
And now with what we talked about, think about it. Stress is lower, sleep is better, digestion's better, bowels are better, you have less free radicals, you have more antioxidants left over to protect your body when you're walking down the street and get exposed to some chemicals, so everything spirals up. You want to do liver support, you want to have good elimination. Babies, feed them, they poop. You give them, feed them six times, six diapers. I ask people, and I stopped doing it, because I couldn't believe people were answering. But I say, how many people are regular? And almost everyone raises their hand. And then I say, how many people have four movements a week? And probably 80% of the people, their hands are up. And then I say, how many people have a movement every day? And maybe a third of the hands are up. How many people have two to three movements most days? I get one or two hands. That's what we're eating three big meals a day. We should have three bowel movements a day. If you're going every other day, where is the waste product from five of those meals? In here. We, in general, store eight to ten pounds of feces that shouldn't be there. And you're not, if this is full, the food can't get down, so you're not getting the nourishment. So how sad is that? Also, how many people have a magazine rack in their bathroom? Or bring the Sunday paper in the bathroom? The only time you should spend any length of time in there is that that's the only place that has a lock on the door and you can get some time to yourself. It's the most uncomfortable seat, your legs fall asleep, you get a brain on your rear end, and all that. Bowel movement should be like urinating. You know, men stand up, but you should sit down, go, and be out of there. So if someone's doing a dance because they have to go to the bathroom, you shouldn't make them pee in their pants. You should be in and out in a minute or two. So if you are in the bathroom for any length of time and you always bring a book in and you're not escaping, you have a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, how do you get sick? Poor diet, toxins in food, poor digestion, um, being constipated and having the foods rotting in the gut, having candida or parasites, leaky gut, overloading the liver, and not eliminating effectively. It's very easy to get sick. You just have to do three or four of those things. Guaranteed, you'll be sick. But you just have to do these to get healthier, no matter how sick you are. That's what you need to do. And it isn't rocket science. <coughs> Liver cells neutralize toxins, make bile salts, lower or raise blood sugar. They oxidize fats, they store iron, they activate vitamin D, they make CoQ10. Those liver cells are very necessary for life and we abuse them. When you drink alcohol, the body, or take a drug, the body gets a pecking order. What's the most dangerous thing I have to deal with first? So if you go out and have four or five drinks and take a couple of ibuprofen so you won't be hung over the next morning, your liver goes into overdrive to deal with the alcohol and the ibuprofen and all the regular metabolic waste gets put on hold. It can only do so much an hour. And so that's why you don't, if you drink too much, you don't feel as good even the next morning because the body is still catching up, the liver got overloaded. So you really want to be nice to your liver. I talked about the back pressure in the liver that can <laughs> trigger hemorrhoids or make varicose veins worse. How many people have had swelling in their hands and their feet, the doctor gives them a diuretic and it doesn't get better? That's the lymph system backed up. That's a, a parallel system, but it's different vessels. And a diuretic isn't going to remove excess from the lymph. If your intestines are backed up, think of the river in reverse. If you're constipated, the liver gets backed up. If the liver gets too backed up, the message goes to the lymph system, don't send us anything. And that's what your lymph nodes are for. They start swelling their storage sacs. So what happens if someone keeps, let's say someone has an abscess and they don't know it in their tooth. And this lymph node keeps getting swollen and very painful. And they try antibiotics, it doesn't clear up. We cut that lymph node out and it doesn't bother you anymore. You just did a job on your defense system. The lymph node was doing a great job. That wasn't the problem. So lymphatic massage, soaking. Anyone ever do magnesium bath or Epsom salt bath? That is great. It's good for the muscles. It helps draw things out of the body. There's also the sea salts. 
That's regular salt is cooked at high temperatures and we destroy everything in it. Sea salts have all the different minerals. <coughs> Celtic salt. That's what we should be eating. That's what we should be are using for cooking. Right? Um, the magnesium flakes very very helpful. I have a whole bunch of products out here, and I'll sort of just go down. And what I started with, and I sort of wrote in the description, there isn't a detox that I'm saying all of you should do this detox because I don't know what's going on with you. You have to think about your river. If you are constipated, first thing you should do is add a good natural fiber that has soluble and insoluble fiber, and maybe a little bit of alum to get things moving and to then get the stool softer and fluffier so it passes easy. Then you broke up that first dam. If it's kids, free product, not Miralax, which is a derivative of antifreeze. You know, if you look at the chemical structure, it's a couple steps away from antifreeze, but perfectly safe for everyone to take the rest of their life in babies. I don't understand how. How about, cute name, Ready, Set, Go. So, <laughs> adults can use it, but it tastes good, so it was designed for kids. Plum, fig, psyllium, fennel, caraway, oh, wow. coriander, and ginger. Can that be harmful? It's not going to give you diarrhea. It's going to help the peristalsis going and soften, soften the stool. Okay, toxic environment. If your body is toxic, it leads to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, diabetes, obesity, cancer, ADHD, ADD, infertility, skin problems, birth defects, liver disease, arthritis. Gee, what a surprise. If our digestive system and our body gets toxic, everything starts falling apart. Allergy. So having, again, a healthy digestive system and giving the body all it needs to do what it should do Yes, the question was, I need a healthy diet, I have a good lifestyle, could I still, and hopefully love life, um, could I still get cancer? Yes, because you could be exposed to something, it could be um, a genetic defect or a genetic mutation. There's no guarantees, but what I can guarantee is that you're not doing all those things. Your odds of getting all this go up through the roof. You are just, you know, teasing someone, come on, punch me. I won't hit you back. And you're just opening the door. So why not, my grandmother, the one with the cow manure, um, <laughs> You used to always say, do everything in moderation and look both ways before you cross the street. Yeah. <laughs> and it took me forever to figure out, you know, it was broken English and I, crazy old lady. And what she meant was, if you do the good and the bad, and you do everything right, you can still get hit by a truck and die, through no fault of your own. So, you want to stack the deck in your favor and be careful, and bad things can still happen. But if you don't do the right stuff, Odds are bad things are going to happen. Okay, so you're ready for a beautiful picture? That's a gallbladder full of stone. How would you like to have that? And the gallbladder is about this big, so some of those stones are like marbles. You know, usually they're like that big. Um, that and kidney stones, from what I hear, and even from women, they say it's worse than childbirth. And God, I didn't know from childbirth, but being there, you know, I don't think I'd want anything worse than that because, you know, you know, that's a beautiful thing. It looked like it wasn't the most comfortable thing for women to go through. And that's a whole nother story. I don't think there'd be a population problem if it was guys having babies because one of us would have a baby and we'd tell everyone else and everything would be super glued. And, cut and, skin. and that would be the end of that. So, thank God for women. Okay, so toxins, you want to help the liver get rid of the toxins so you have good bile, you have good digestion, the body cleanses, sorry if it keeps getting in your way. So our liver is really our, our friend. Um, what can you do for liver support? All different ways. and. No matter what your issue is, there's a way to do it. There's homeopathics. 
liver gallbladder HP, a homeopathic, you can take it once to three times a day, very tonic for the liver, you have a lot of bloating and gas. Um, and liver symptoms, that's helpful. If you don't know what you should do to start detoxing, Newton Homeopathics makes a wonderful detoxifier. It's just six drops under the tongue at bedtime every night. Most people find they start sleeping deeper within a few nights. They also, it does help you detox. If you want a capsule, there's herbals, very tonic in capsule form. If you like Integrative Therapeutics, they make it. So all the good companies make similar products. Um, Dandycom, wonderful product. It's a liquid. You take about a third of a dropper full a few times a day. I really recommend to a lot of my clients that they do some liver support, not a liver flush, but liver support at least twice a year, a month each time, fall and spring. And very, very tonic. We're all, all of our livers are overloaded. Some people need to do it for three or four months because their liver really is backed up. There's products like Nutriplenish Cell Detox. This has a lot of the great antioxidant support. The backbone's a good multiple vitamin, but it has all the things the body needs for detoxing. Or not all the things, the majority, a lot of things. So it's very, very supportive if you're going through a detox because it'll help protect the body. There's anyone with leg cramps, restless leg, and constipation, that's usually, a lot of times that's a magnesium deficiency. So there's magnesium glycinate, there's combination magnesium products. Magnesium is wonderful. We're getting too much calcium, which is constipating. It makes the muscles tight, and magnesium relaxes them and we don't have enough magnesium in our diet. People who aren't sure what they want to do, if the bowel is working okay, something like the first cleanse. There's two products, one bottle, you take the capsules in the morning, the other one's in the evening. Very easy, it's like AM and PM. And it's seven days, and that very gently gets the bowel moving, so if you're a little constipated, it supports the liver and the lymph. It's a good start. All these things you should be adding a good probiotic with it. It doesn't have to be 225 billion organisms. Mm -hmm. You want, it's like, if your gut is in pretty good shape, it's like grass seed. You just want, those of you that have lawns, you just want to overseed. You don't have to dump 100 pounds of grass seed down. So you need some every day. If you have C. diff, you want a huge amount because you have to repopulate. But it doesn't, mega doses, a lot of times you don't need. Anyone that takes a probiotic, I hear often, I, whenever I take a probiotic, I get gassy and I don't feel good, or I get constipated, or I get diarrhea. That, believe it or not, gives a lot of good information. That means you really need a probiotic. <laughs> but what's happening is you have a lot of opportunistic organisms. And so the body, when you put the good bacteria in, you're killing, you're bumping off a lot of the bad guys, and the body can't clean that metabolic waste out, so it aggravates you. Open up the capsule, take an eighth of a capsule or a pinch, just a little bit of the grass seed, and slowly over weeks mm. build it up. Someone who takes a probiotic, which are the bacteria that are supposed to be here and feels worse, they need it more than anybody else. But you have to start slow. Some people are very sensitive. Some people, when they use a detox, a liver support product, or one of the homeopathics, not often, but they say, I didn't feel as good. We had them added to water and take a sip for the first few days. What's happening there is the body's using the energetics from the remedies and it's been waiting. And so it's flying. <laughs> it's just responding too fast. So you want to slow it down. We talked about the enzymes. Probiotics, they should be in the refrigerator. There are some good non-refrigerated ones if you're traveling. But you're better off, you want them live. You want them to be happy and grow and go forth and multiply. <laughs> Anyone ever do an infra, uh, far infrared sauna? Okay. Anyone ever do a regular sauna? Regular sauna, you have to get the heat way up to get you to perspire. When you perspire, blood flow goes up, everything kicks into high gear, you detox very, very effectively, you know, because it's coming out in the perspiration. The advantage of the far infrared sauna is there's infrared built into it, so at a lower heat, 
it heats up the body, it's the infrared, and it penetrates deeper into the tissue. So you don't have to cook yourself quite as high. You can control the heat and get it way up there. But that's very interesting. Um, found a company, I wound up buying one at home, for home, and it is wonderful. You know, I do a lot of long distance bike riding and I find after I do 40, 50 miles, I rehydrate, get in the sauna, and the next morning my muscles are a little tight, but it's that good tight, not, honey, help me get out of bed, I can't stand up. So that's very, very good. Um, there, uh, hopefully, there's going to be some places around where you can go in and pay for a session. The problem is you need to shower afterwards, so you have to have a shower there too. And, and we were thinking of putting one in, but there just isn't the room here. You'd have to go to a third floor, I guess. But so that's very good for detox and foot. Anyone do the ionizing foot baths? It starts out on the left with clean water. It's just water. And it can look like that. What's interesting is if you go online and you look into it, some of the companies, which I'm surprised the FDA hasn't gone after them, and this is one of the times I think they should, they're talking about if it's brown, it's coming from your liver, and if it's white, it's the lymph system, and if it's greenish, it's coming from the gallbladder. That's baloney. What I did was when we got this, I ran it here with nobody's feet in it. And we have MWRA water, and at home, I'm out in Natick, we have town water. So I ran it in both places, and the water turned different color with nobody even touching it. Really? That makes sense, because there's minerals in there, and when you put ions in the water, the minerals coalesce and drop out. What was interesting, at home, my wife, my son, and my daughter and I, we each did it, so it's the same water. We change the water, but it's the same <laughs> spigot, same machine, and each of us, it looked totally different. So how could that be? So then being the analytical person I am, I called one of the labs we use for testing and said, if I send you a sample of the water, can you tell me what's in it? Because that would be fascinating. Yeah. And they said, yes, but since it's unknown and there's thousands of chemicals and things, they said, you're probably talking four to five grand. Oh. So I was interested, but <laughs> Another thing, what would happen to you if you put your feet in water, warm water for a half hour? What would your toes look like? Oh. All shriveled up. When you do this, they're full. They're not shriveled up. And if you have any calluses or dead skin, just with the paper towel afterwards, it comes right off. Some people, if they have an injury, they can feel a tingling up their leg at the injury. So it's mainstream now is saying we have channels in the body that go from here all the way down to our feet and things go up and down those channels. We just discovered that. Out over in the Orient, they've known about, they call it meridians for 2,000 years, but the West just discovered it, so it was valid. But what really happens is this really doesn't detoxify you. This is like a battery charger. Our cell membranes are supposed to have a charge to them, and that allows water and nutrients in and water and waste product out. When we're stressed, we have nutrient deficiencies. That polarity goes down, so things don't cross as well. This is putting ions in the water. They go up the meridians and basically balance the charge. We're an electrical machine. So your body is doing the detox. It doesn't, it just, your body's doing what it should be doing more efficiently than it was. So most people find that they're exhausted and they do it, they feel a little bit clearer. If they're revved up, they feel a little calmer. The majority of people find they sleep better the next few nights. What a surprise, the detox pathways are working better, so the liver isn't as overloaded, and you get into better run sleep, which cleans up the mess of the day. So, a lot of people find the stools and the urine the odor changes slightly afterwards. That's a good thing. That's a lot of the metabolic waste coming out. And you need to come out. So it's very, very interesting. We're running a special. If you buy three sessions, you get a fourth session free. And detox foot pads have things in them that help draw out. And that is good. Not as good as the sauna or the um, foot bath or even if you go and have a lymphatic massage or get into a clean hot tub 
or a twin whirlpool, that's very good. The downside of the public whirlpools are they're loaded with chlorine mm -hmm. and who knows what else, but let's say just chlorine. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, just the MWRA water, you go into have a hot shower, a five minute shower, you have that hot water, you open up all the pores. They say internally you get the chlorine exposure of being in a public pool for an hour. So, yeah, no shower. <laughs> then you won't get sick because nobody will go near you. But they sell little shower heads that filter out chlorine. You know, so why not? You change the filter every couple of months. Okay, so. <coughs> We talk, there's good and bad products out there. Most of them are good. And you can buy from us, we can help you choose. But all I ask is that when you buy a product, buy it from somebody that knows what they're talking about. When you go to a big box store, some things you're better off buying it there, it's less expensive. But a lot of the big box stores on the nutritional side, they're looking for what's the biggest container for the least money with the right name on it. And it may not be as effective, so in the long run, it's very expensive to put it in work. Like some of the probiotics that are in the big, huge stores, if you start doing some research on them, they're not that effective because there's not much there. It's labeled well, but it's not biologically or pharmacologically active. Um, these are some suggestions. I put this out, just some people don't want to open up three bottles every day. That's just too much work. And then go to the refrigerator and get the probiotic. Orthomolecular and there's other companies that do this, they put in the multiple vitamin, the omega-3, and the antioxidant capsule. And it's in a package, you open it up in your mouth, down the hatch, and you're done for the day. It winds up, they just introduced this. This is a two month supply of those three products for $70. So a good fish oil is $20, $20 a month by itself, good multiple vitamins up there, so it's less expensive than buying three of them. Um, if you buy good ones in good quantity, it winds up being less expensive, but then you buy filling out a lot more. So I just put that out there. There's a product DMG, dimethylglycine. That has been a sleeper, but it's really catching on now. We need to methylate in order to detoxify and to use things. Folic acid, we have to convert it to methyl folic acid. B12, we need methylcobalamin for it to work in our body. And the problem is with all the toxins in the environment and in our bodies, a lot of us don't methylate well. And that can cause a lot of problems and we get more toxic. DMG, dimethylglycine. It gives us two methyl groups and a glycine group. Glycine is one of the building blocks of glutathione, and the body strips off these methyl groups and uses them to help detox. So when I was reading a lot of the literature on dimethylglycine, first I thought it's snake oil, because whatever they were talking about, it helped. And nothing can help everything. But then when I went to the science side, it makes sense. We need glycine the methyl group be healthy. So if you're adding glycine to methyl groups, all the different conditions should get better because the body's working better. So it really isn't, a, I don't think it is a snake oil. So I just threw that out. So where I'd like to leave you all is, um, I'll be going upstairs to answer questions. If you have an idea about your river and what area you need help with starting downstream, I'll be more than happy to give you some suggestions of what to try or what to do, it'll be helpful. If it's more complicated than that, I would be doing you a disservice, and one of the things we pride ourselves on is, I could, I wouldn't, but I could sell you all a ton of stuff tonight. All this stuff is excellent for detox, but a lot of you wouldn't get better, because if your river is jammed up, and you are working up here, and you need to be working down here, you're not gonna get better, and you're gonna say, stuff didn't work or I felt worse. And I don't wanna do that. I want everyone to take baby steps forward. Nobody should have to go backwards to leap forward. So if it's a little more complicated, 
I'll say we can have a sheet upstairs because there's a lot of us here. If you would like to set up a consult time, we'll be able to call tomorrow and time to time and do a short consult. But it's not come back every two weeks. Usually the consult, I give you my, my direct phone number and my email, and I want progress reports every week. But generally, it's a quick two-minute phone call or a couple of emails, and I might say, increase this. Or let's back off that a little bit and make sure you're eating enough of this. That's all included in the console. So this isn't to get you in here every single week. It's to make me look good, to get the right information so you get better. Because that's the best the best way. It's not for the console fees. It's getting the information for the right the right help for each of you. Any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, how much time would you say would deliver Most people, if they do it right, they eat healthy, they're exercising. They, the question was, how long does it take to clear up a fatty liver? Usually the doctor says, we'll check you next year because, you know, you're not going to go in and biopsy it every couple months. But generally speaking, within a couple of months, you're already going in the positive direction because once you start supporting, the liver is processing instead of storing. So what happens right away, depending upon how fatty it is and how much junk is in the body will be how long it takes to clear up. But we've had people who, again, spontaneous heal of the liver. You know, when they went back a year later, all of a sudden they don't have the fatty liver. See, you were lucky your body did it on its own. But it didn't. You changed something. Yes? I have a compromise with that pizza to uh, the king. Um, from what I just read about what, what I want to do, I kind of have a double problem. Right. So you have to go compromise lymph system. Or a woman who's had um, breast cancer and had some of the lymph nodes removed or a lymph stripped on one side. What you need to do is, in that case, you want to go even slower because you can support the rest of the lymph system or get not. You don't want to do lymphatic squeezing to drain it out. You want to give the body what it needs to work the best it can. Same thing with the liver support. You want to give the body the building blocks and let it work at its own speed, not do a liver flush. Because so leukemia, in my case, is collecting in the liver. Right. And all the other organs. Right. And it doesn't dissipate the way it should. It should. It can it. Well, I don't know. Everyone is different, but doing some gentle support, most people's <coughs> systems can always work a little or a lot better than they are. Gotcha. And so, you know, it would be worth seeing. And depending upon your symptom picture, when you're doing some gentle work, you'll be able to judge, am I moving in this direction or am I moving in this direction? And that'll let you know. Eventually, we all hit the best we're going to be. Thank you. How do genetic... Uh, Mutations that are gut specific affect your recommendations? Or do you require or do you wonder about genetic mutations? Okay. How do genetic mutations, you know, you can have test a lot of genetic areas <coughs> to see if you have a, they call it a SNP, which means you don't use this pathway well. What I tell people in general is, Let's not go to the genetics at the very beginning. Let's do the basics. So if they don't know it, why spend hundreds of dollars if it's basic things that need to be done? Where the genetics come in, and I did a profile on myself, and I have some half SNPs, and I don't have any of the conditions that those are SNPs of, but what's interesting is down the road, if I start developing a problem in that area, and we can't put our finger on it, knowing genetically that's very helpful because with those SNPs, knowing them, there most of the time there's ways to work around that um, pathway that isn't functioning. It might, might have to go this way to go that way, but you can always get around it. And we could test every single gene, but they only test the ones that they have, we know something we can do to help with it. Because why find out you have this genetic mutation if there's nothing you can do? 
That would just drive me nuts. That would drive me nuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if you're missing your gallbladder, you've had it removed, yep. have you found that people like that tend to gain weight more easily? Yes, because you're not di if you don't have a gallbladder, do you gain weight? Yes, because you don't digest as well. And so you don't process it, but taking that enzyme with some bile salts in it can be very helpful. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention, people who are taking the acid blockers, generally you figure if you're not digesting as well, you should lose weight. Most of those people gain a lot of weight. And I, I had it in one of my slides, I can look it up if anyone wants the exact number, but we make a big jug of hydrochloric acid every day to use and that takes about 1,100 calories to make. So if you're blocking the formation of the acid, you're not using the energy. You're not burning the calories. So even though you're not absorbing as much, you're packing on calories because the body should be using it. So I just thought, it just came to my mind. Mm -hmm. was an interesting and, and if you don't have the gallbladder, can you imagine that would make you more hungry? If you don't have your gallbladder, will it make you more hungry? Yeah. It could. If you're not digesting well, are you hungry? Yes. If you're eating food that has empty calories, are you hungry? Yes, because the brain says, I need the nutrition. So you wind up packing on a lot more calories and fat to get it in. Now, another interesting thing is we all think we need low fat, low calorie to lose weight. Fats, because of cholesterol and hydrogenated fat, got a real bad rap. It takes more calories to digest fat and protein than carbs, even healthy carbs and grains. So that's why the Atkins diet worked. You know, people eating two dozen eggs a week and bacon and cheesecake and all that, and they lost weight. Now, it isn't the healthiest diet, but it required a lot more calories to be burning a lot more energy to digest that food. So if you're going to the gym and you're cutting yourself down on your calories, if you're working out properly and exercising the muscles, you're better off adding more protein and adding more calories, reasonable, healthy calories, adding some healthy fat. I'm not saying eat two avocados a day, that's not healthy, but for most people, a half an avocado. But if you look at how much fat, We've been terrified of fat. We need fat in our body. And so you can really slim out the South Beach diet. Excellent diet. It isn't a diet. It was by a cardiologist, how to eat healthy. I lost 18 pounds. And I love to, I love to cook and I love to eat. And I could be 400 pounds, I think, without even thinking. And my wife told me I could never be a cook. Not that I can't cook, but I like to eat everything while I'm <laughs> and so it would never work. But I had to set my smartphone to ring every two hours of my life. I never had anyone have to remind me to eat something. And I found I was, with the food the way I was eating, I was always full and I wasn't hungry, but I had to eat every two and a half hours, have a snack in between the meals. And I lost 18 pounds and I was tired. I never thought I'd say that. I was tired of eating. And I was leave me alone. You know, I don't want to eat, but it really makes sense. Has anyone ever had a free-range chicken? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You buy this little dinky bird for like eleven dollars instead of a Purdue oven stuffer for, for six dollars. And I looked at it and I said, "Okay, that's what I'm eating. What's everyone else going to have for dinner?" <laughs> and just the leg and the drumstick, little tiny leg and drumstick, I was satisfied. And why? Because it's nutrient dense. It was real dense food. When you eat a piece of wild salmon compared to farm raised tilapia, you could eat a pound of tilapia and be hungry. And one four ounce piece of salmon, you're full. Why? There's something there. The body, the message goes to the brain I'm happy. Leave me alone. I don't need more. Another thing, how about? Anyone heard it takes 10 to 15 minutes for the brain to get a message that you're satisfied? <laughs> what do we do? We sit down, eat this big plate of dinner in 10 minutes because we got home late and the ball game's coming on. Well, we have to go pick up the kids. Where the brain's still hungry. It doesn't know really it was fed. There's a delay there. So what do we do? We graze the whole night. Trying to satisfy the brain. Eat twice as much. And you didn't need to. If you slow down and just 
added another five or ten minutes to your chewing your meal, your brain would be satisfied, you wouldn't be grazing all night. Mm -hmm. So it isn't complicated. We just have to be in the moment, enjoy each moment, get out and walk. Any Thank you so much. so if you want to go up, we'll be up and...